My name is Tim Rice. I'm going to be the chair of this uh, panel. Uh, I thought that uh, it would be very fun for us to... Uh, we've celebrated the 50th anniversary of our society about in 2005, and I think over the next few years we'll have the chance to celebrate many other 50th anniversaries. And uh, I thought that uh, celebrating or reflecting upon the 50th anniversary of the publication of two seminal works in the in the field, uh, Bruno Nettles' Theory and Method in Ethnomusicology and Alan Merriam's The Anthropology of Music would be an interesting uh, locus for reflection on the field and where we've come in the last uh, 50 years. Uh, sadly, one of these authors we lost in 1980, but thankfully, uh, one of the authors is here with us today. Uh, I... <laughs> I, uh, I also in invited um, people who I thought had probably entered the field as graduate students in the decade after the publication of these books. So if you're young, uh, try to imagine yourself uh, or us as you uh, many years ago when we entered the field as young people and encountered these two books. So I've asked the, uh, our guests, our panelists, to uh, reflect on, on that with us. So we'll have each of them will present and then we'll uh, have maybe a little bit of time left over for discussion, or maybe not. But uh, <laughs> I think we should begin with uh, perhaps our honored guest, Bruno Nettle. Well, thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I could spend uh, a lot of time. Can you hear me? I just stay too far away. It needs to be higher and closer. Maybe you should use, I can probably use one of these. Is this all right now? Can you? Can you? Yeah, really close to the oh, okay. How's how's that? Uh, <laughs> I I I could spend a lot of time expressing appreciation and a degree of embarrassment to find that the publication of my book should be commemorated and indeed along with the anthropology of music, which I think has been far more influential. I have to confess that I feel rather surprised to find that I'm still around after 50, <laughs> after 50 years, uh, a matter of some good luck. Uh, and I want to thank Tim Rice and all of you young panelists uh, for considering it worthy of some attention. Uh, I feel extremely honored. Thank you. Uh, my feelings of pleasure have to be mitigated because it's also a moment of sadness uh, because my counterpart must be re should be represented uh, by an empty chair. Uh, I appreciate be being given a chance to say a few words by way of background uh, from the perspective of 1964 uh, and what it was like to work in the field at that time. Uh, most important, these two books appeared at a time when a lot was going on in ethno, things were clearly stirring. It was kind of a moment of a great leap forward. The idea of training people to be ethnomusicologists had taken hold. And then let me mention a few milestones that were happening. Uh, in 1961, uh, Kurt Sox's last book, The Wellsprings of Music, in which he finally changed his mind about some things. Uh, 1962, Alan Lomax began his Cantometrics project at Columbia University. Uh, the major meeting of SEM in 1962 in Bloomington uh, was sort of a 10th anniversary, and the 10th anniversary issue of Ethno, uh, 1963, uh, which has significant items, basic position statements by Merriam and Hood, historical statements by McAllister and Rhodes, and the long review of Kurt Sox's book by Kolinsky, and a substantial symposium on dance. And then in 1963 was the founding of the International Institute of Comparative Music Studies in Berlin uh, by Alan and Daniel Liu. Uh, 1963 also was a symposium on transcription and analysis at, uh, at Wesleyan University. Uh, uh, and well, well it, was, it was held in 62, appeared in 1963 in Ethno. Uh, and uh, 1963, importantly, also saw the publication of uh, Harrison Hood Poliska, book titled Musicology. Uh, I want to come back to that for a moment. Uh, and then 1965, uh, Prentice Hall uh, 
uh, undertook to publish a series of. I beg your pardon. They can't hear. You can't hear me. How many? How is, is the microphone on? Yeah. Now, now is it better? I'm very sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, 1965 uh, was the the Prentice Hall Music History series uh, appeared with two volumes on non-Western music. Uh, I'm sure I, we can come up with others. Uh, it was a year when uh, Professor William Amam and I divided the world into two parts. He wrote the book on Asia and I on everything else. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, uh, my book was really the result of a conversation in 1962 with Theodore Karp, uh, then the music editor for the Free Press, later a distinguished medievalist at Northwestern University, uh, about the need for a text. This was 1962, as I said. Uh, there had been some books about world music and comparative musicology as a field of research, largely in German. Uh, but by 1962, uh, there began to be courses in which students might need to read about what ethnomusicologists did, uh, or had, had done, or should do. Uh, and then at, at some meeting, we happened to meet, and Ted Karp uh, approached me. I tried to write something that would tell what ethnos had done and were doing. I confess I was never very happy with that book, especially the music in culture part. My problem was, of course, how, from the beginning, how does one organize a book about a discipline? I had some older mo models, but the main problem was how to organize a discussion about music in culture. I fiddled around with that ever since, tried several approaches, and I'm not sure now why, in 1964, I couldn't have done better than to have just two chapters, one looking at music geographically, uh, in geographic space, and the other in time. Let me say just a word about the reception of these books, uh, not, not as much as some of you may say. Uh, the reception, however, of the two indicate something of the way ethnomusicologists saw themselves divided into representatives of anthropology and music. I tried in my book to hold what seemed to me sort of a, uh, sort of a middle ground, uh, but Merriam, in a review of it, saw it as insufficiently anthropological, while David Morton, in another review, criticized it as being too much from an anthropological perspective. Uh, in ethnomusicology, Merriam's book was reviewed by two scholars, Robert Spencer wrote appreciatively from the perspective of an anthropologist, and William Maugham praised the book, but he did so mainly by expressing the belief that it showed the musicologists among us what, if I can put it that way, what they were up against. <laughs> uh, Bill Maugham wrote, I'll quote him, if we can get past our disciplinary paranoias and offer each other constructive criticisms based on the particular knowledges each of us possesses in depth, then the grand synthesis will begin to appear. Uh, but somehow it seems strange today that this major book, had to, uh, Merriam's book, had to be tackled by two people from two designated perspectives uh, that SEM had sort of uh, officially made this uh, bifur bifurcation uh, policy. Uh, one gets a somewhat similar feeling from Merriam's review of Harrison Hood Poliska. Merriam's review of Hood's chapter, Music, the Unknown, keeps suggesting <clears throat> that Hood doesn't really pay attention to the things that Merriam regards as central, the kinds of things that he wrote about in the anthropology of music. And he suggested, by contrast, that in that book, Harrison Hood Poliska, the, the chapter by Frank Harrison, largely on historical musicology, seemed to him more properly ethnomusicological than Hood's. In those days, well, we, those guys, uh, spent a lot of time, a lot of energy trying to, uh, to delimit ethnomusicology and to write to those who didn't conform to a particular definition out of the field. Today, clearly, we've synthesized, as uh, Professor Mao predicted, and we've become very definitely inclusive. Maybe sometimes I think more than is good for us. Uh, I can't talk about this without saying some personal things about Alan Merriam. Uh, we first met on December 31st, 1952, uh, an important date in the history of uh, SEM, uh, but I won't go on about that. Uh, and we were friends for almost 30 years, though we often disagreed, uh, uh, disagreed about things. 
I felt that he was a person of strong opinions, but of great integrity. After he moved to Indiana and I to Illinois, we had frequent exchanges visiting each other's schools, sometimes bringing students along. Merriam loved to debate, to argue, and he wanted his students also to do this. We uh, also related personally in various ways, although Alan was not a man who easily revealed himself. Even so, he was a great communicator, frequently writing short letters saying things like, I haven't heard from you recently, uh, what's happening? Or, I didn't see you very much at the last SEM meeting. Uh, he probably would have loved Facebook. Uh, uh, we had, let me finish with this, a, a curious and in the end sad kind of relationship involving birthdays. When the national meeting of SEM was held at, uh, at the University of Illinois in 1973, it happened to be his 50th birthday. And so we put happy birthday, Alan, on the hotel marquee. Uh, he loved that. And he wanted a photo of it, but actually we never got around to taking one. Six years later, in the fall of 1979, November 1st to be exact, I ran into him at the Indianapolis airport. I was going east and he was going to the west coast. And after a short chat, he fixed me with his forefinger. Do you know what day this is, he said. I had forgotten. It's my birthday. I thought you always knew that. <laughs> and he went off to his gate, and I never saw him again. A few months later, it was on my own next birthday, March 14th, 1980, my 50th birthday, actually, big celebration. I suddenly got a call saying that Alan's plane had crashed in Poland. You'll understand that I can never celebrate my birthday now without remembering that moment. Thanks.